Hello, my welcome um, today to our 10th uh, speaker series with uh, Malama Ike Kai. And we're glad to have our friend and big supporter for a long time, Ron Bave. I'm great to see him. I haven't seen him in years and I'm, I'm really happy to see him here. So I'm gonna go ahead and give the pule and get us started and then I'll hand it off to Tate. So, e pule kako. Hello everyone. Uh, my name is Tate Kiliho Malu. I'm gonna be introducing um, our speaker for this evening. So thank you for hopping on and joining us. Uh, but just to introduce our speaker for tonight. So Ron Vave is an indigenous Fijian who works, uh, who, whose work for the University of the South Pacific between 2000 and 2014, which involved trainings on natural, natural resource governance and monitoring across seven countries in the Indo-Pacific region. He just graduated with his PhD in marine biology from the University of Hawaii at Manoa with an inter interdisciplinary disciplinary research that sought to determine how the cultural practice of indigenous Fijian funerals in Fiji influences and affects social and ecological resilience. His recent publications for 2021 are in the Asia Pacific Journal of Public Health, and the journal for the Royal Swedish Academy of Science. In the latter, he system, systematically elucidated five types of culturally protected water body practices by indigenous Fijians across Fiji and showed that more than three decades um, of conservation organizations efforts to help communities protect the environment were in fact contributing to cultural erosion. So without further ado, we have uh, Mr. Ron Bave. Thank you. Aloha everyone. Uh, thank you to the Maui Nui Makai Network for having me on this talk today. <clears throat> it's been a while uh, since I've met some of the people online here. It's good to see you again. And I'm hoping that, you know, with the sharing today, um, that just as I have learned some things from this research, uh, that you would as well. So the basically the presentation that I'll do today is the findings from my PhD research, which was based in Fiji, and it was specifically looking at how these indigenous Fijian cultural practices contribute or influence social and ecological resilience. Uh, currently, I'm a postdoc with East Carolina University, and I'm thankful that a few of my uh, colleagues are on here, uh, Dr. Sidna Ryan and Dr. Adina from EC Santa Cruz. <clears throat> so, protected areas aren't new to Fiji. You know, they've been done in the past, and as you can see in the picture that's here uh, on the top, there's a funeral procession. You can see the coffin being carried there. And basically, <clears throat> basically in Fiji, uh, or at least some parts of Fiji, after the burial has taken place, uh, the communities then protect the portion of the reef or river for about a hundred nights, after which it is harvested and the catch is used in a memorial feast. <clears throat> So culturally protected water body practices aren't new. Uh, at least in the literature, you can see that in Vanuatu, uh, they would establish a culturally protected area on the reef or river following the circumcision of a child. And that's from that publication by Francis Hickey. Uh, in Fiji, at least there's two known instances <coughs> for chiefly installation and also for the funeral of a person. But these are largely perfunctory in acknowledgement. It's just one sentence or two that talks about these cultural protected areas and nothing more uh, than that. <clears throat> in Fiji, uh, for the funeral protected area for a chief's funeral in 2008, when that protected area was eventually harvested, there was about 1,500 pounds of fish that was harvested. And this is a funeral protected area that was only about three months long in duration. And so the questions that I'm asking is, you know, what types of cultural protective water body practices are being done and whereabouts are they being practiced? Um, to what extent are they still being practiced today? I mean, it's good to know what they are, but, you know, are they still being practiced or not? Uh, who is it done for and duration as well? So these are the kind of things that's lacking in this various literature that's being done here. <clears throat> and so there's a fragmentation in the body of knowledge. Uh, not only in terms of the literature, but also in the minds of, unfortunately, indigenous Fijians ourselves. And so different value systems, uh, because of this missing knowledge, 
they would not be included in planning, they would not be included in consultations, and so they would not make it into rules uh, that will be developed. And so because there's a fragmentation in the knowledge, it could contribute to an erosion of all of these things, such as knowledge, the practice itself, and ultimately indigeneity, given that this is part of what makes us, us. Um, so whenever there's a funeral, um, people would come from other parts of the country, but also around the world, and they would bring with them their condolence contributions like these mats. Some mats are specific to different parts of the country, so it's only made by people from those areas. And then you can also see the kappa that's here. Uh, people would not only come with uh, traditional artifacts such as mats and kappa, but they would also bring food as well. So here you have kalo uh, or taro, and also here you have ava, as you can see here. There's also honu uh, that's also harvested, but sometimes because this is currently an moratorium in Fiji, whenever honu needs to be harvested for cultural practice, communities will have to seek approval from government ministries such as fisheries to get an exemption and they will basically state what the number of turtles should be harvested for that particular function. And so because lots of people have gathered, they will all need to be fed. And so sometimes these cultural protected areas would help with provisioning, with food provisioning uh, to feed everyone that comes. But for funerals, because they occur unexpectedly, you know, oftentimes there's no cultural protected area that's in place pre-funeral, but after a funeral has occurred, they usually set up a what's called a funeral protected area. And so just in case people don't know where Fiji are, the Fiji is here, there's Hawaii up there. Uh, and basically in Fiji, there's about 306 islands. <clears throat> about 306 islands, we've got the two main islands, Viti Levu here and Vanua Levu on the top there in the north. The capital is down here, uh, which is where I live. And so one of the research that I did at the very beginning of my PhD was trying to find out what the cultural protected water body practices were. And I found out that there was five, and as you can see here. The first one is to do with the conception of the eldest child. So as soon as a woman is found to be pregnant um, <clears throat> to her eldest child, in the past, she is not allowed to do any chores. She is uh, only allowed to bathe inside the house. And the women in the, in the village would basically come to her house and look after her uh, to a point where it'll be considered like up to eight months, you know, of no work whatsoever. Only when the midwives see that, you know, if she does any work that it would not harm her or the survival of the child, only then is the, the expecting mother allowed to go outside. She then bathes in the sea or river and that area is then protected. <clears throat> so that's the conception to the eldest child. The second one is to do with meconium. Interestingly enough, with meconium, uh, basically what it means is the first poop or the first excrement of the eldest child. Uh, that when it's collected and placed in the sea, um, that area is then protected after which it is harvested at a later date for a feast. Now, there's an article that has already been published in the MBio journal. I've shared the PDF with the organizers of the talk and you know, hopefully you can read more about this because I won't be going too much detail into this. The next type of protected area is to do with circumcision. Basically when the dressing falls off the wound, uh, it's then placed in the river or sea, that area is then protected. The fourth is to do with chief investiture. So when a chief is installed to be the new chief, when the person is installed to be the new chief, uh, the person is not allowed to go outside for at least four to 10 nights. Uh, only then do they bathe in the river or sea, that area is then protected. And finally, the last one is to do with this funeral protected area. So after a person has died in some communities in Fiji, they would protect an area uh, after burial. So you will see that for these five culturally protected areas, in the literature, there was only mention of these last two. And again, only one sentence. So we don't know about all of these five. I did the research, I looked back at the literature from the 1800s and found that they were historically practiced throughout the country, but over time, this knowledge seemed to have faded out. But you will also see that these cultural protected water body practices uh, go from conception, uh, even before birth, 
all the way to death. So it runs through the various important milestones in the life cycle of an indigenous Fijian. Now, for Miconium, again, this is the first excrement of the first poop of the eldest child. I read through the literature, and one of the things that, one of the reasons why Miconium is important is that when it comes out, it means that the child will survive. If it stays uh, within the system, if it stays within the child and doesn't come out, and if it enters the bloodstream, it could be fatal to the child and also the mother. So somehow, our ancestors knew this, and they were able to correlate the two between meconium coming out and also the survival of the child. And that's why it's celebrated. And so knowing what the five culturally protected water bodies are, I wanted to know where in Fiji they established and to what extent they're still being practiced. And also because my research uh, for my PhD was on funerals, I was especially interested in these funeral protected areas. <clears throat> and so I'll go into uh, more detail on this. Uh, and again, for this cultural protected water body practices, uh, you can read about it in that article that was sent around. So Fiji uh, basically is several households, interrelated households make up a village, and there's about 1,100 villages in Fiji. Several villages make up a district, of which there's a total of 189 districts in Fiji, and several districts make up a province, of which there's 14. Now, the different colored zones that you see here, the different colored regions, these are the 14 provinces. So this, all these islands in black are in the Lao province, which is where my dad's from, which is also where uh, I'm from because we're a patrilineal society. So that's where my village is located. My mom is from this province of Mbua, which is shaded blue. So that's another of the 14 provinces in Fiji. And just... Uh, to put things into context, that's where the capital city is where I'm based, or was based, while I was doing my research. So there's 189 districts in Fiji, and you can see that each of the provinces, like this province of Mba, you can see all of these are districts, which means that, say for this particular district here, there'll be several villages, interrelated villages, that make up this district. Now, I could not collect data at these 1,100 villages all across the country because uh, that would be just too much work and also very expensive exercise. And I could not collect it at just the 14 provinces. So what I did was I collected this data across the 189 districts that you can see here, just so that it's representative of the country, given the fact that no such systematic data collection on these culturally protected areas has ever been done before. And so this is a photo of my village. Uh, this is basically the village of Sawana. So that's our church there. This area here is the chief's residence and that's our family home just behind the chief's residence. And the reason for that is, you know, the location of homes in a village are strategically located. So for us, because our family uh, we have the traditional role of a herald, which is the spokesperson for the chief. We're basically the conduit of communications between the chief to the people and also the people to the chief, which is partly the reason why our home, village home, is located just behind the chief's house. And then you've got the church there. Uh, this is another angle of it, and you can see, uh, see here, there's multiple other villages that span all across these islands here. And this is our family home. Now, the other thing that I wanted to show from this picture, this I took this photo in 2017. So again, this is my village here. Just to put into context, when I'm referring to a village, this is uh, what I'm referring to. So that's Sawana village, which is my village. Now there's another village next to it, which is Loma Loma village. They're basically separated by a small drain, but two different villages. There's another village that's in there and that's called Urone village. And the reason why I'm talking about these villages is because remember when I was talking about the districts that I will um, do my sampling at? So my village is Sawana, together with all these villages, we belong to this Lama Lama district. And so it is that district level information that I will be presenting, although I'm collecting data uh, from the villages within, such as this one's listed here. And so again, you have the 14 provinces. Uh, what I did was 
I visited 16 villages uh, all across the country, which are marked in these green spots here, just to be sure that the data is representative. I then did offsite interviews. So if there were people, say from this villager here, when he visited the capital, I met him there, interviewed him, but I was collecting information for his village. So that was considered an offsite interview. So right now, total of 33 people between onsite interviews and offsite interviews. The other one was phone interviews, because I could not travel all over the place. I did phone interviews, and that was a total of 100 people. And then finally, uh, where the gaps are, I used Google survey forms and primarily targeted specific people that were known to be knowledgeable about culture for that particular district. And so a total of 201 people were interviewed from all across the country. And hopefully, you know, this data, given the wide sampling, is representative of Fiji as a whole. And so again, here you have the 189 districts. And so what I did was I was thinking about the usefulness of the findings to communities in terms of ease of interpretation. So what I would do is I would visit each of the districts, say here where the capital is located, this district is called Suvovo District, and I would ask the villages within this district if they would protect a body of water, either reef or river following the burial of a loved one. If they said that they do, and they still do today, then I would basically shade it green. And I'm basically just using these traffic color indicators, something that people are familiar with, and I would do this for the rest of the country. So what we'd be expecting is a map uh, using these four colors that's here to kind of say whether practice is being done there or not. And I would ask it for all the five cultural protected water body practices that I've already talked to you about, uh, sampling at 189 districts. And so here's the Fiji map. One of the things that I could do is I could present a single Fiji map for each one of these five cultural protected water body practices, but that could be a lot and it could miss some of the information, uh, the layers of information that's there. So basically what I did was I sectioned uh, the Fiji map and I put them as the small zones. Yeah, so Vitilevo Island, that's that one. Uh, Vanuolevo Island, the second larger island is there and so forth. So this it's this Fiji map uh, that's presented in a row here. And the reason for that is presenting the results like this. So here you have the five culturally protected water body practices starting from conception to first poop to circumcision, chiefly investiture and funeral. And you can see the results for each one across the country. Yeah, but at the same time, you'd be able to look across the various protected areas. So for the first three, you will see that a majority of them are red. You can see that 92% of the districts do not practice this first conception protected area. Meconium, another 92%. Circumcision, 92%. But when it comes to chiefly investiture, the numbers slightly increase. So now there's 23 communities that practice uh, chiefly investiture protected area in Fiji. For the funerary, that has a much higher number of 74 districts that implement this funeral, the, the funeral protected area, which is about 42% of the communities in Fiji. <clears throat> and so there's a possibility that perhaps the elders or the people that I've spoken to here with regards to the first three cultural protected water body, maybe they've just forgotten that it was a practice. And interestingly enough, one of the communities did say that they did not do Mekonian protected area in the past. But according to the literature from the 1800s, there was an interview from their community which basically stated that they did. So there's uh, some contradiction in the information there, which could mean that over time, the information has been lost from the minds of people, indigenous Fijians ourselves, um, you know, through the process. And so for the five cultural protected area practices, given that the funeral protected area is widely implemented, I'm going to specifically look now at the funeral protected area data. So this is the funeral protected area practice map that was seen before. Uh, you can see that a majority of the eastern half of Fiji, of the main island, uh, still established funeral protected area after the burial of a loved one. 
in the outer areas where my mom's from, they still establish it for most of the districts there. Uh, here, specifically for my community, where my village is, we also implement it. Uh, but the thing is, at this point, we still don't know um, who it's established for, how long it's protected, what exactly is protected and all of that. And so that's kind of the thing that I wanted to dig deep into. And so, again, the same map that from before, but I'm presenting it across the country here. And you can see that for the funeral protected area, 42% of the community still establish a uh, funeral protected area, which are shaded green. Yeah. 34, commun 34 districts or 19% have ceased altogether. So who it's protected for? You can see that the one shaded in yellow are for chiefs and elders, meaning that these districts shaded in yellow here, the communities would only establish a funeral protected area just for if a chief or the elder or an elder dies. And by elder, I'm referring to the head of a tribe or the head of a clan. In other districts, like the one shaded here in blue, uh, so that's about 34 districts or 20% of the districts in Fiji, funeral protected areas are established for anyone that dies, which could mean a lot of funeral protected areas being established at any one time. So it could be a river that passes through one of the communities and there could be multiple funeral protected area within that same section of the river around the same time because they establish it for anyone that dies. The third question about the area that's protected in most of the places where it's established for anyone, you will see that they also protect different places, which makes sense because, uh, you know, people would protect different places for different people that have passed on. In other places where it's protected for chiefs only, funeral protected areas are established for chiefs only, you will see that it's gray, they're protecting the same place over and over again. And so because it's established for chiefs only, it would mean that, you know, a chief who's ruling for 60 years, and then he passes on after 60 years of uh, leadership, that would mean that there would be no funeral protected area happening between that 60 years. Whereas in these communities where funeral protected areas are established for anyone that dies, it would mean that multiple funeral protected areas are established uh, in any one year. In terms of duration of the protection for this funeral protected area, a majority of 44% of the communities protect the reef or river uh, after burial for about 100 nights. Now, 100 nights is about a little over three months. And one of the things that I've been asking communities is why 100 nights were selected, people don't know. It's just the number that has been used in the past. Uh, it seems that the, mean, the reasoning behind it has been lost over time. <clears throat> now, there are other communities, they protected uh, just for one year, and these are largely for chiefs. So it's a longer period of protection. Uh, as you can see in places where funeral protected areas are established for anyone that dies, it's only 400 nights, which makes sense because there's many people, that there could be many deaths uh, or funerals, unfortunately, uh, at any one time. Now, what's of interest here is that there were five communities, these are shaded in yellow, and so these ones here, they do not have a duration of 100 nights or a year, but it's completely different reason. And I'll touch on it on the next slide. And so when we're looking at what's protected, you will see here that uh, the one shaded in yellow, they protect basically everything in the water, fish, invertebrates, no harvesting of any resource whatsoever when these funeral protected areas are established. The other ones in green are those five communities that I was talking about earlier. They do not protect it for 100 nights or one year. So these ones, these five communities, they protect fish, invertebrates in the water, but they also protect the root crop. So basically what happens is the people that do the funeral, after they have done the burial, now they will have soil or mud on their hands and also, also on the implements that they use, such as spade or fork. They would then head down immediately after burial, they would go down to the sea or the river where they would wash themselves. And there's sort of this thinking that maybe there's a transference uh, from handling the corpse or the body of the deceased, 
that may have gotten on to the people that were doing the burial that is now in the water and as such, uh, the water is sort of considered unclean or untouchable as well. And so there's no harvesting uh, that's happening in the water. But for these five communities, after the people that did the burial have washed themselves in the water, they would then go up to the plantation. They would plant kalo. And so if they planted kalo and the kalo would mature in eight months, then that would mean that the duration of the, protect, the funeral protected area would be eight months. Because it's when they harvest the funeral protected area, they would harvest the fish and the invertebrates from the water and they would harvest the kalo uh, from land, and the two would be eaten together. So that's the reason for, uh, you know, the different duration of eight months uh, for some communities. Now, we know that what's protected is 47% protect everything, and this 3% of districts protect fish and vertebrate and root crops, but what exactly is harvested? And as you can see here, 25% only harvest fish and invertebrates, and another 22% in blue, they harvest fish only, so they don't touch the environment. So in a way, uh, maybe there's some indirect transference of uh, protection on invertebrates that aren't harvested at all uh, throughout that period. <clears throat> and so again, this is the same funeral protected area that I had shown for the entire country. Uh, over time, I collected data from the 1960 to 2019 for interviews that were done. And these are the actual funeral protected areas that was established around the country. Now, the small circles simply means there was one funeral protected area that was done. This area that's shaded in blue, that's Ba province. And there was a total of eight between 1960 and 2019. And the reason for that is because it's only done for chiefs for, from these provinces. Now, in provinces where funeral protected areas are established for anyone that dies, you will see that there's a whole lot more uh, funeral protected areas that are established. You will see the small circles, which just represents one funeral protected area established in one year. And then you will see these larger circles, some of which are four to at least 10 uh, funeral protected area that are established in any one year. So in this one here, in the province of Ra, that was six, funeral protected areas that was established in one year. So just the stretch of river, uh, there was multiple protected areas set in one time. And so you will see that for some of these communities here, they are coastal communities. So the funeral protected areas established on coral reefs. And then you've got these coastal, these communities here that are up inland. So they would be protecting sections of the river. So the cultural protected area practices that have been happening have been in a way managing the resource both coastal and inland uh, over time. And this has been historically practiced. So the people from these provinces of Naita Siri uh, and also Boa province here where my mom's from, because this has been practiced often and multiple funeral protected areas are done in any one time, they would have seen it. Uh, and so it still would be fresh in their minds. When I interview people from other provinces where there's few and fine between, some of them do not know, and these are, by the way, indigenous Fijians that I was talking to, they would not know that there were these funeral protected areas that were established in their provinces. These three provinces, there is no funeral protected areas, uh, practices that established at all. So this is, in a paper that's currently and well, just been reviewed, I just need to uh, work on the review and get it back to the journal. <clears throat> and so in the past, we had this cultural protected areas like this funeral protected area practice. These are small areas of the fishing ground that's protected and they were protected from anywhere between three months to a year. Uh, for Fiji, we have our fishing grounds, our customary fishing grounds, and we have management rights over it. And so we can close, or by we I'm referring to the community, they can close certain areas just by the decision of the community themselves without having to consult or get the approval of government or any other body. And so this is what was done before, just a cultural protected area practice that was done, small, three months to a year, uh, that's done over time. And then conservation areas came in. Uh, there were often larger areas that were protected. There were 
between three to five years and sometimes permanent uh, in terms of uh, duration. And so there would be multiple protected areas that's running. One is a cultural protected area, then you've got the conservation area. And what has happened is that the amount of fishing ground that's available to the increasing population within the community has reduced. And so communities are saying, hey, you know what? We cannot have multiple protected uh, fishing grounds like this. And so what they started doing was they started uh, foregoing their cultural protected area practice. And part of the reasoning for that, which you know, I found out from my research, is that conservation organizations did not know about the cultural protected area practices that's happened. And this can be seen in the literature. Uh, there's rarely any mention uh, other than the two that I'd mentioned earlier, just one line, excuse me, uh, mentioning about the uh, chiefly investiture and also the funeral protected area. So over time, the conservation areas were displacing the funeral protected area. One, a fault of the conservation organizations and said to say, I was part of the conservation work in Fiji prior to doing this research. So I was one of the people uh, that, you know, I didn't know about the, all the cultural protected areas and that was done in Fiji uh, until this research. So again, having talked about conservation, having talked about the funeral protected area, it's important now to see where the conservation organizations are working. So Worldwide Fund for Nature works in that region there, Wildlife Conservation Society, and then there's Conservation International. At least these are the three main conservation organizations that are working in Fiji. And what you can see here is that these organizations are working in places that overlap with communities that implement uh, funeral protected area practice. Same here in Conservation International, all of those green ones are actively implementing funeral protected area. And yet publications coming out of these various organizations do not uh, mention this. Except for Wildlife Conservation Society, they came out with an ecosystem-based management plan, which actually incorporated the cultural protected area, specifically the funeral protected area for communities in this region. And so that was a good thing that I was recommending to other conservation organizations in Fiji as something to emulate. And so the lessons learned, one, because they're a place-based practice, uh, it's only if you're in the community often or based there, do you see these practices being, being implemented. Uh, so it's actively known in your mind. Whereas for those that have moved, that have migrated either to cities or towns, uh, because they don't see these place-based practices being done, uh, it's easy uh, to forget that you know, these things are happening. The other thing is just a lack of awareness, particularly by conservation organizations. One is a fault of conservation organizations uh, for not listening to communities. So in some of the interviews that I did with communities, they would mention that, you know, they tell the conservation organization staff, hey, you know what, we do this cultural protected area practice, such as the funeral protected area, but conservation organizations may already have goals of the number of protected areas to establish. And so they're coming in with a specific goal of establishing a conservation area. And as such, uh, they easily uh, put aside the cultural protected area practices when it's mentioned. Sad to say, uh, because communities do not bring it up again, uh, that practice is not documented in the management plans that's developed. The country conservation that's done has a lot of funding support. Uh, however, you know, as I had shown earlier, in places where conservation work is happening, there's also communities that are actively implementing cultural protected area practices because the cultural protected area practices are no longer being done. Say, for example, the funeral protected area. If a community has as its normal practice to establish a funeral protected area. When the conservation area came in and they've stopped doing the funeral protected area, one of the things that hasn't stopped is the number of funerals that occur. And so when funerals occur, communities now harvest the conservation area 
because there's no funeral protected area that's implemented. And so it's key for conservation organizations. The success of a conservation um, could be enhanced if you know your community that you're working with, and particularly these kinds of cultural protected area practices, that if you don't know about it, it could have this sort of kickback effect, a negative effect on the conservation work that's being done. Uh, some of these practices are done just for chiefs, but because there's been conflicts on who should be chief, sometimes between siblings, sibling rivalry for chiefs and so forth, uh, there's vacant titles, vacant chiefly titles, because the chiefs are not named officially or in traditionally installed. Uh, the practices that are only accorded to chiefs, such as the funeral protected area in some communities, are no longer done. And finally, you know, this is happening worldwide. There's increasing population, which means increased demands for resources. And so sometimes, um, you know, it's all competing uh, within the same fishing ground. So that has another negative effect. Thank you. Um, that's basically the end of that presentation. I'm sorry I went through it quickly, but that's my email just in case there's any questions later on. That was awesome. Um, right now, I guess we will open it up to any questions. So you can um, throw it in the chat or you can unmute yourself. No, I just said, wow. <laughs> Wonderful presentation. Wow. We have, a, we have something in the chat box. All right. Um, from Adina says, Ron, how transferable this issue to other islands? The issue of displacement of cultural protected area practice, uh, is that what you're referring yeah, to? Again? Yeah, the conflict between the cultural protected areas and the more tradition, not traditional, but, you know, standard conservation practices like manage, you know, ecosystem management and areas like that. Yeah, for one, uh, as mentioned earlier, the, the Cultural protected area practices are place-based. So there's, there's specific communities that implement specific cultural protected area practices. They're the only ones that can do it. Um, for communities that do not practice it, it's not transferable to them. Although I have been seeing some communities that never used to do funeral protected areas in the past, they are starting to do it now. And part of the reasoning for that is that these communities that never used to practice it in the past you know, there's intermarriages between different parts of the country. And so a woman or a man that's from another part of Fiji for which funeral protected area practice is a common practice, when they come to a community where it's not a practice, sometimes the community themselves would say, hey, you know what, because it's a practice for you, we'll implement it here, even though it's not part of our practice. So in that sense, there's some transfer that's occurring. Uh, but for the most part, um, the practice itself is not transferable. The issues are, and so it's important that communities, conservation organizations will learn, uh, you know, that there's a lot uh, that still needs to be done. And it's about having an open mind uh, when approaching, when working with communities. Uh, sometimes even for me, you know, I, I mentioned I was part of the conservation work that was actually setting up these conservation areas around Fiji. So I was part of the problem in the past because for me, my upbringing was in a Western society. Went mm -hmm. to school, the university, I was taught conservation. There was very little literature on cultural protected area practices in itself. So I'm hoping that this research with the information that it's generated will be transferred back to communities. We've shared it with Institute of Indigenous Knowledge and Culture in Fiji. So I'm hoping that they will put it back to conservation organizations. So when conservation organizations approach communities, you know, before starting conservation work, they'll be told, hey, we already have this cultural protected area practices in place uh, for these various communities. And in that sense too, I'm also hoping that the simple mapping using, using traffic indicator colors that people are familiar with would be easy to interpret and share those maps around. Sorry, hopefully Adina have answered your question with regards to transfer. Yeah, yes, you have. I, I have a slightly 
follow-up question, if that's okay, if nobody else is. And that's more regarding how parallel, if you, or if you see parallel, that there's some parallels between this cultural conservation conflict there versus cultural use. So it might be in other places mm -hmm. that there is a cultural fishing or cultural fishing rules um, or indigenous fishing rules that have such conflicts. Do you think that in such cases there is also need to be some you know, consideration and would you suggest the same lessons learned from the cultural practices that you see in Fiji to other, uh, you know, to Hawaii or Guam or Java or other places where they have other, you know, cultural traditions that may yeah. be in conflict? Yeah, uh, good question, Adira. So I think the one issue there is that conservation largely means closure, complete closure, no harvesting whatsoever. Whereas with these cultural protected area practices, it's about community. It has a time frame in which it's protected. It's just a short term. And then it's harvested at the end of that. And it coincides with a time when the community gathers again. Uh, for that final feast. So in the case of the funeral protected area, that's for the memorial feast. And it's usually the final feast that's done in memory of a loved one that has passed on. So that I think is one of the issues that's there currently, um, that dichotomy between uh, conservation and with regards to cultural protected area practice, the fact that it's open closure. And then it's not permanently set uh, communities can change it, and I think it's good that communities have that flexibility to make that change. However, it can arise to conflicts. Uh, you know, one of the things that was mentioned earlier is that because conservation uh, organizations have come in, established, they've worked with communities, they consulted communities, they've established a conservation area with communities. But the thing is, because the cultural protected area practice has been kind of sidelined or no longer done, that kind of has that negative kickback effect on conservation. Now communities, because they've not established that funeral protected area, when it comes to the gathering for that final memorial feast for their loved one, communities are now going to harvest the conservation area. And so with the work that's being done in Fiji, that's part of the locally managed marine area, one of the key uh, tenets of that LMMA work is adaptive learning. Basically, we don't know it all. Uh, there's new things that we learn as we go through, much like this cultural protected area practice. And so now that we know about this cultural protected area practice, we just simply incorporate it into the planning that's occurring and adapt accordingly. Thanks, Fran. That's cool. Thanks, Adina. So this question by Dr. Sidna Ryan, by the way, Dr. Sidna Ryan is a professor who I'm working with here at East Carolina University. He's asking is, do you know if your maps, interviews and conversations for this work have, have encouraged any communities to revive or restart these traditional practices in areas where they used to be practiced but are no more? Um, great question, Sid. Uh, for me, I think, I'm hoping that it will, uh, you know, where it used to be a practice in the past that they will revive it. But I think it's too early at the moment. I think there's no, uh, given that I've just finished the research and just graduated in uh, December, results have been returned back to communities, results have been given back to Ministry of Indigenous Affairs. They're being filtered or percolated down through the various levels down to community. I'm hoping that over time that we will start to have these stories come out. And I'm also hoping that as part of the Fiji Locally Managed Marine Area Network work, that they will start to see this, you know, more of, it's not just conservation areas that they're monitoring the numbers of, but they're also looking at the cultural protected area practice that's being done uh, and also revitalized in places where it's kind of ceased. Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, so much of the protected area practices that's done is largely around milestone events, 
for people, for indigenous Fijians. So conception, uh, circumcision, uh, first poop and all of that. So it's not really coinciding with the reproductive seasons. If it may, I am yet to uncover that. It could be, but I just didn't explore in, uh, into that one. Great question. Damn it, I should have incorporated that into my PhD. <laughs> By the way, I am not going to do a PhD again. Not that I'm discouraging others. Myla, stop laughing. Can I ask you a question, Ron? Yes. Um, I'm just wondering, I know the focus on this was more uh, looking at conservation, but I wondered if you, uh, uh, you know, like I'm, uh, as a cultural outsider, like what some of the social benefits to those funerary uh, protected areas are in addition to, you know, I, I think you were thinking more about the biological conservation ones, but I'm interested mm -hmm. in like the social ones. So funeral protected area practice, just as an example, if you were to look at the social benefits, one is having, other than having food when there's a gathering that's occurring, two is that for us in Fiji, there's seven traditional roles. Um, this goes for more, all indigenous Fijians, there's seven traditional roles in indigenous Fijian societies. The first one is for chiefs, second one is for warriors, third is priests, fourth is the um, traditional carpenter, which are not known as Matai, and there's also traditional fishermen known as Nguan and Dao. So when it comes to things like cultural practice, when it's time to harvest the funeral protected area, it's usually the traditional fishermen that go to harvest. So that's the Nguan and Dao. So it's keeping those traditional roles alive as well. Uh, for implementation of the funeral protected area. You know, it has to be a decision by the community and ultimately it has to be the chief's decision. So that also, uh, you know, strengthens the role of the chief themselves. So there's multiple benefits to this. Also, with regards to funeral protected areas, there's also those various resources that were seen before, you know, that I was explaining, the kappa, the ava, uh, all the food, the mats that was brought in, all that is part of this practice that's done, um, that is revitalized if these practices are kept alive. So there was a question from... Marala. Thank you, Debbie. There's a question from Nigel. Here we also plant placenta, pick of our newborn keiki in the kai this type of practice be included in the funeral protection so is that its own no no all good perfect question so nigel in fiji we also do a similar thing when a child is born they take a portion of the the umbilical cord that's been snipped at the hospital and if the the idea is that you know we want the this boy say for me if you want my son to be a farmer to be good with the land, working the land, then usually we'd plant it under, uh, you know, a certain plant like a lemon tree or a coconut seedling or something, and that's done on land. If you want the person to be a fisherman, then it'll be placed out at the reef. So that's like how kind, kind of the, what they want the person to become. Uh, that is still done to date, although the protection is not done on land. The protection that's only done is the ones that's done out at sea. Again, you know, maybe there's another research that could just focus on uh, land cultural practices uh, that's protected like this. Because for me, my focus uh, was solely on the protected areas that's done in aquatic water bodies, so river or reef. But great similarities between Hawaii and Fiji. Wow, mahalo, Ron. I'm, I'm kicking myself that I came late and I'm looking forward to the recording. Mahalo, bro. Welcome. I think for me, while the abstract for the talk may have talked about, you know, conservation displacing, um, you know, cultural protected area work, that's not to say that conservation is bad. Conservation has its good sides. It's just a matter of really digging deep and for us working with conservation organizations or in conservation organizations ourselves, 
I think it's key to have an open mind when you work with communities. Sometimes we can be biased by the Western education that we're coming with, that we've closed our minds to certain practices like this that might not be important to us, but are important to communities. And as this research is showing, if we have that kind of mindset when working with communities, it could lead to cultural protected area practice uh, erosion. And then I think, you know, I know when I initially shared my findings with conservation organizations, staff, friends, uh, longtime friends in Fiji, uh, they did not like it, you know, because we have been working with communities for long. But the thing is, I was telling them, hey, you know what? We learned this together and we can improve things moving forward. It doesn't have to be uh, this way all the time. So not to belittle conservation work. If you're working in conservation, well and good. But please keep an open mind in working with communities. Yeah. And again, I'm still new to this. There's still lots to learn. Uh, I do not know it all. <laughs> so I'm willing to share with you. You know, that's what's happened in Fiji. Definitely don't want it to happen to Hawaii or any other place. But ideally, I'm thankful that these kinds of talks allows for the sharing of lessons um, so that we can, you know, preempt it so it doesn't happen to us in the future. Okay, so I want to mahalo everyone for attending today and not only for um, welcoming Ron and supporting him, but also supporting the network and the effort that we do for um, our communities in the Makai resources. So we look forward to seeing you folks in May. Like we said, we'll be taking uh, April off um, if Tate wants to speak a little bit more about that again. But um, we appreciate your, your presence and your um, guidance today, Ron, and thank you for your presentation. Um, and it is a hui ho, brother, because I hope to see you soon, like we said. So, and um, good luck on your postdoctorate um, there in the mainland. So, Tate, if you have anything, thank you, by Mike. all means, the floor is yours. Thank you. Nope, um, that, that's a great close up. Just May 19th will be the next one and we'll be doing it with uh, the Kipahulu Ohana, Namamu Mu'olea, and then uh, Dr. Chris Bird. We'll be going over some Opihi work. So, yeah. Oh, yo. Thank um, you, Dr. Vavi. Wow. Oh.